we were in Leviticus last week, and um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't make fun of this book. I don't make fun of anything in the Bible, but Leviticus is obviously not um, something you go read to get all excited about because there's a lot of thick stuff that's heavy in there. But last week when we talked about the scapegoat um, or later on in the book um, and, and dealing in the middle of that with the sacrifice system and, and all that they had to do, and thank God we don't have to do that to be forgiven now. Amen? But now when you look at, back it up into chapter 6 now, the one thing that God really started kind of poking around at me about even last weekend before church was the one common thing, even Dan in the, the sacrifice system, there's one piece in there every time that they had to sacrifice something that we have in our church still yet today. And what is that? The altar. The altar was the one thing that every sacrifice had to go on because it had to be on something for it to be sacrificed and offered up. And so when they would bring it, you would see everywhere along the way that the sacrifice would come wherever they were and that the altar stood as a place, Clorinda, for that, that offering to sit before it was consumed. They also used the altar a lot throughout the Old Testament when they would get excited to celebrate about something. If you go through and look through the Old Testament in a lot of places, you'll see that uh, when they came out of a big victory from God, either the Israelites did or a lot of the founding fathers of our faith did, Adele, uh, throughout the Old Testament, when something good would happen, they would build an altar at that point as a reminder when any time they would travel around in that area, they could look at that and say, hey, something good happened here. And Gary, they would always name it somewhere. I even love my favorite altar, uh, not trying to be funny, but it's, only, it's, it's funny because of the name. And King James calls it uh, that they named the altar Ed. You, know, you see these names, Bethel, Ashiel, and all these different ones. Well, there's one in the Old Testament that they said, and they named the altar Ed. I'm like, that's my favorite one right there. It's just like, hey, we're excited, but we don't want to do anything huge. And maybe they were tired, didn't want to come up with a big name. So they said, we're going to name this altar Ed. For all the guys named Ed, Edward, Eddie, they all jumped up and said yes. Because something important, it stood for that. We do that in our homes, don't we? You want to commemorate a big day or you want to commemorate things that happen in your life. And what do we hang on our wall? Pictures? We'll be married 19 years this October. 19 wonderful, glorious, fun-filled, never had a bad day in the world, and whatever else I can say to stay in good graces, because right now I am. You guys know what that means when you're in good graces with your wife. Don't mess it up. 19 years. Guess how many pictures we have of our wedding on our wall? Yeah, it starts with zero and ends in another zero. I don't know why. One of my good friends was our photographer, and uh, we, we, uh, he took all the pictures. We have the proof book. We still have that, and it doesn't have his brand on it yet. Maybe the statute of limitations by now has run out. I keep threatening to take them to Walmart or to Meyer or whoever can blow them up and say, hey, can I have about a 1,000 copies of this one just so we can hang something to prove besides the ring and the license that we got married? People were actually there. It happened. We have a video. Uh, my kids want to watch the video, and we don't want them to watch the video. We're like, no. It's, isn't it funny? A couple of years out of getting married, you watch the video all the time. You look at it, and you go, oh, this is wonderful. And you slop around, and you cry and everything. And after about two or three years, you're like, yeah, that, that happened. But I don't really want to look at that anymore. So I don't know why. That's me, right? Or you, either one. Quit looking at her, Brian. Look over here. So you commemorate that. We commemorate, is it okay to have it? Somebody asked me one time, and they said, Krista, is it okay to have an altar in your house? Sure. The the lady I know in my brother's church would have an altar right over uh, to the left of her couch over near the wall where her hearth was. It was just a small one about that big. And every day, that's where she started her day out in prayer, knelt down at an altar. The cynic is going to say, well, you don't have to kneel down at 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 an artifact to pray. And I would agree. No, you do not. Are you with me? Do not leave here and say, well, he said we have to have an altar in there. And now he wants us to cover our head when we pray. Now he wants us to do this and that. I'm not saying that. But it is a nice reminder. And it is a nice thing to look at, though, Toby, and see. Just like in the Old Testament, they celebrated. I want you to understand and and take that point home with you. They would celebrate great things that God did by actually building an altar and naming it for what he had done. The altar is the symbol for a lot of things, but it's a great symbol of communication. You know what happens, Ray, when we go to an altar of prayer somewhere? 
the God of heaven, the almighty, the maker of all things, listens to me. Does that soak in, Carol King, to you when you say that? The God of heaven, the one that made everything, the creator of all, king of kings, lord of lords, actually is stopping what he's doing, Doug, to listen to what we have to say. I don't know about you. I get a little excited when I think about that. Amen? On either side here of the church, we have an altar right up here. And I believe Pete made these, didn't he, Pete? Right? Just say yes if he didn't. That's okay. Yeah. Pete's thinking about it. You know, he's, he's waxing poetic back there, rubbing his chin. But right, Virginia? Yeah, he did. That's, who did? Tom? Tom made them? Tom's back there looking around. Hey, man, look over here on this right side, on this side. I'm sorry. I just saw wood and figured Pete, you know. Tom, thank you. How long did it take you to make these? A week. You know how long it would took me? I'd still be trying. That was how many years ago? You know, right? So, you, Tom, can you remember every step making these, everything you went through to make them and bringing them in here and putting them up on the side and all that? You know, we're moving over to this wall over here, right? So if we need longer ones, are you good? Can you extend these out and all that stuff, right, on that side? But at the same thing, it's not just because they match the decor. These stand for something. Are you with me? These stand for something. When we come in, everything in the church, if you go back to the, even in the New Testament, when Paul would go into a synagogue, and, and a lot of times they didn't even understand why, Darlene, they had some of the things in the church that they did. And Paul would tell them and point out and preach and get them all excited. Well, these are not just things that match the handrail or the, or the paint in the room. This is saying, this is the communication. This is the telephone, if you will, Brandy, to God to say, God can hear me when, he, when I meet him there. Why do we kneel at the altar? Anybody want to throw that word at me? Why do we kneel when we come and pray? To be humble, right? You, do you have to kneel? No, you could stand there. But the one, the one parable that Jesus read and was talking about uh, in the New Testament, Jim, about the rich guy and, the, and the, the, the poor guy, there was a bigger word for him there, but I just call him Mike, rich guy, poor guy, snooty guy and humble guy, basically. And the snooty guy was standing, remember? And he was thanking God for all that he was. Him, not God. He's thanking himself saying, I give all of my money and I give all of my time. And I'm, uh, oh, and by the way, I'm hot. You know, I'm what's wonderful. And I do everything perfectly, you know, Brittany. And I do all this stuff. I, 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 I. And he even goes to the point to say, now thank you. I'm not like this dude down here on his face. And the guy on his face, you know what he was praying? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'll take his prayer any day of the week, won't you? And so that's why you don't have to kneel down. No, it's all the, the semantics and the, and the legalism things of it. But, you know, it feels pretty good to humble yourself to the one who is responsible for it all. Amen? So we, I say all that to set up to look here. The Lord spoke to Moses. So if the Lord's speaking to Moses, Moses is listening. And he spoke to him and he said, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. We went over a lot of that last week. But he says, the burnt offering shall be on the hearth upon the altar all night. That's a long time, right? Until morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. There's a thread that you'll hear throughout these just handful of verses that we'll read. And that's the beginning of it. He says, put the burnt offering on the altar. And he says, then leave it on the hearth right on the very front where everyone can see it and keep it going all night long until morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. We went through some of that last week when they had to have the right clothing on, the right, um, the right representation, and they had to handle all that the correct way. And he shall put on his body, take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. Everything has to stay, Gary, in that one holy place. It does not leave that area. And even those that are carrying for the offering going on, Louis, around it and the, and the, the, the sacrifice, everything stayed there. And he said, he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. So they had to change their clothes to deal with the ashes from the burnt offering that they had there as well. Do you see how seriously God took the sacrificial system, the sacrificial uh, part that they had to do? It wasn't just walk up there, throw something in a pit, burn it, kill, leave, go on about your business. 
Because forgiveness is not just some flippant little thing that we get just out of the sight of God's mind. Amen? There are times when you and I may not take our prayer life as serious as we do. But let me assure you that God takes it very seriously. The fire, here we go. The fire shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offering. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. What one thing do you see continually throughout that group of 8 to 13? That the fire is never put out. The fire, Bev, continually is going on the altar. In this particular sacrifice, different from last week's, but this one now, this is for the continual asking, the continual pleading to God for his blessing and for his presence and his forgiveness in the camp. They had to keep it going. They had to keep it moving. The, the, the priest who would take care of it had to follow by the directions, the explicit directions that God gave. You know, you don't have to come into church. Those of you that sit in the same seat every week, that's like a ritual for you as well. Amen? Do you do that? Some of you are in different seats today, and I don't even recognize you. Thank you very much. But can we, you know, let me, let me just step off the trike for a minute because I can't ride a two-wheeler yet. But I'll step off the trike and say... If we, if we aren't careful, we can turn coming to church just like the priest going through his ritual at the altar. Because, okay, I come in, put this on. Now, if I'm going to wear my church clothes to church, I'm going to wear them. And then when church is over, take them off and go back to being like I was. Right? Then when I come out there and be that way, then leave that out there and come in there. There's no leaving that out there and coming in here and leaving this in here and going out there. It needs to be the same person going in and out of both places. Amen? You know what I appreciate about everyone in our church? Unless you got me really good and fool, and if you do, don't tell me, okay? Is that you're who you are. God sees you. So it doesn't matter. The worst thing for me is when I see somebody and they feel like they have to all of a sudden straighten up. You know, Brittany doesn't do it. Are you kidding? Yeah, she's the same. Everywhere she goes, right? Pat doesn't do it. Can I tell him again, Pat, what you told me on Wednesday night? Pat, uh, was it Tuesday or Wednesday? I walk into, where did I walk into? What store? Thank you. Thank you, choir. The Meyer choir here. (laughs) Pat's working hard. Pat's down on his knees. Pat's, you know, merchandising and down there working. Any man working on his knees is a godly man. Amen? He's praying to the Frito altar right there where it's in front of him. And he's moving the bags around. And he looks up and he goes, oh, they get uglier as they come around the corner. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. And I didn't think about it later. He said, what you should have done was turn around and look behind you and said, who's behind me? (laughs) Usually I would have done that, right? That's just Pat saying, hey, pastor, I love you, right? Now he's thinking, you ever come around my corner again, I'm going to ignore you. (laughs) There it is. There's, there's, that's part of being who we are. Be who you are, okay? But now if you've got some ugly parts that need Jesus, are you listening? And we all have those. Do your best to keep those away from all of us to see them and start giving them to him in private. Raise your right hand. I promise. I'm just kidding. But do that. Okay? I do that. I I do not want the whole world to know how bad I could be at times, Gary. Amen? You're saying you got a double life going on, Jim? No. I'm saying I need Jesus 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter how good I'm doing. And you know what? I may not have Tom construct me an altar for my home yet. (laughs) But I do have a place that I can get alone with him where I can speak to him and talk to him. And he says, hey, here's what's going on. Can I tell you the thing that's in common with every one of these sacrifices that we've read in Leviticus is this place right here. This piece that they had to use. Now, I don't know how it looked. I don't know exactly how it was constructed. It might have been wider. It might have been deeper, Craig. But it still represented what we still do here when we come into God's house. This represents God saying, I'm available. Isn't that good? This represents God saying, if you'll meet me here, I'll meet you. If you'll meet me where I am, I'll meet you. He even goes a little farther than that, doesn't he? What does it mean for them to say, Those three times that we've read right in those verses to say that the offering, the fire must not go out. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It shall not be out. The fire in verse 13 shall always be burning on the altar. There are at least three different reasons for that. Number one, the original fire on the altar came 
from God himself. The original fire, Pastor Dave, that came down says that came from God. I don't know about you, but we could come in here and talk and laugh and just do our thing and have a donut or two, or we can come and wait for God to show up. Amen? We can come and and turn church into just another experience, or we can make church exactly what it needs to be. Number one, we're the church. Look at your neighbor and smile really big and tell them they're the church. I haven't done that in a while. I don't like doing that. Well, that's, that's... I didn't take a poll, okay? We're the church. We have a great building. Amen? We have a great, look, it's going to get even greater, right? As soon as we get everything moving along. But the building itself, I love our building. I do. I think it's beautiful. But this is going to burn up one of these days. That's kind of sad when you think about it, Jim. All this work and one day it's all going to be gone. But you know what? By the time we get to heaven, we're not going to carry anyhow. Amen? This is just the place we meet you and I, the people that tell you you're ugly in public, that's our church family. <laughs> My blood family tells me the same thing, so it doesn't matter. It's all right. It's the church family that we have. Somebody the other day, and I've always been this way all of my pastor life. Everywhere I go, they look at me, and if I see them, Mike, I could, I could, we could leave today. And if I saw you out somewhere, I'd be like, Mike! And Mike might look at me and go, what? <laughs> and walk the other way. You know, like at the recital the other day when we saw our kids out there dancing and having a great time. When I see people outside, I'm like, hey, how you doing? You grab them and you hug them and you shake their hand. And one time a guy in Kentucky asked me, he said, you just saw me two days ago. I said, I know it was a long time. I missed you. You know, you have Toby come and shake your hand and hug you. You know, things start to crack and pop. He gets you. It's exciting, right, Toby? I love that. Why would I not be excited to see my family? Amen. If I see you five days a week out here somewhere, when I see him, I'll be like, Gary, how's it going? Yeah. Not, hey. Or as the kids in school, my, my son's grade, they all say that one little three-letter word. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Sup. <laughs> what is that? Is that short for supper? Is that, you know, is that, did you miss a cup and you don't know, the, did you lose the C to your cup? I don't get it. It's just like, what? So we don't, we can't say what. It's, it's short, Eric, for what's up, right? So instead of saying what's up, as we would say back in the good old days when we grew up, when life was real, they just shorten it down to sup, you know? So I think from now on, we're going to call greeting time sup time, okay? <laughs> so every time we go around shaking hands, we're all going to be looking at each other going, I don't know. Just a thought. I don't know if that's going to work or not. The younger crowd would love it. Do you get more excited if God showed up today? If God dropped like the guy dropped when he was sick into the house where Jesus was teaching and God came right through the doors and came right into place today, would we sit here? Oh, you're using this one on me. Yeah, I'm using this one on you. Would we sit here and look at him and go, wow, that's God? Or would we all fall on our faces and begin to worship? Are you kidding me? So let me help you. Even though we don't see him with our eyes, Sarge, he's here. Amen. He's with us at work. He's with us at home. He's with us in this place. And so the fire showing up, the fire there represented the fact that God was there. And and Rodney, they did not want that fire to go out as a reminder to those people in the camp, in 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 the community where they lived, in that very civilization was God is here. Keep your act right. God is here. Worship him. God is here. We're going to do what it takes to make sure that he stays here. If we ever needed a fire burning in America today to prove to people that God is here, we need it today. Amen? Because he is here. Here's the second reason why. Perpetual fire symbolized the perpetual worship of God. So, Ray, when the fire kept moving, not only did it show God is here, but it was worship him continually. It doesn't end at noon-ish, does it? <laughs> right? Somebody was talking about we're, they're playing a community revival, and um, I was at a meeting to do that this week, and that's going to be exciting when I get to tell you more about it. But they were looking around the table. It was Tuesday, and they said, well, what time do most of you guys get out on Sunday? I don't want to tell you what most of them said, okay? And they said, well, noon, uh, 11.45. I heard all different kinds of times. I'm like, oh, that's good, you lightweights. You know, what time do you start? And they all said, one of, only one of them said 10.45. The rest said 11. I go, you start at 11, you got 11.45, you go, yeah, what time do you get out? I go, 11.44, what for? What's of it, you know? 
No, I did. I had to say that, then I had to repent really quick, right? So we're in here. We don't have a whole lot of time with each other, really, do we? If you stop and look at the time we have in this place, if this was the only worshiping I did, I would be severely anemic in my spiritual life. This is a primer. This is a starter. The goal of meeting together collectively like this is to get you so out of whack. Carson, when you leave out of here, you're like, Jesus loves me and you. You can hear color when you get out of here. You're so excited. That'll sink in a minute, hearing color. Okay? That's exciting. Remember when I told you when I drank that Red Bull in Tennessee many, many years ago? Remember that story? Yeah. I think my heart is still beating from that one. I thought, what's the, what's the rage with that? But you know what? Why can't we just be all red bulled out for Jesus? Oh, you're the pale people with the big eyes that walk around like this, Kareen, and, and they think, oh, here they come. You know, they want something. <laughs> they got to be looking at me for that kind of thing. They want something. I don't want anything. I've got something to give you. <laughs> Amen? Let's turn the table. We can talk about marital stuff and we can talk about kids raising stuff and we can talk about finances and jobs and health things and all the stuff that goes along last night i was going to sleep and god really laid something on my heart and he said don't settle for what the world tells you is the norm now i've been raised in church tara and i've known all that kind of stuff all my life there's something about in your old age like me when god really sets something that's new but old but time true and i looked and i thought you know what That's true. The world doesn't have to tell me that because the older you get, the slower you go. Amen? Hogwash. Or that that if you're a Christian, you don't have fun anymore. You have to be straight-laced. That if you worship God, then that means you have no fun. How many of you are worshiping God and having fun? And don't raise your hand to make me feel better, right? I'm going to, okay, here's another one on my wife today. We're embarking on a new little situation here in our life with our with our dietary lives that's the best way i can put it and she was a greeter today and she kind of you know digging out of a digging out of a spot with it we have in the last couple of days and she went around me today and terry she left the front in her eyes she goes my eyes are watering i have so much injury i don't know what to say <laughs> it went right past me and i thought man she looked like my wife but my goodness she was on skates and she felt good i'm like i started waving my arms praising god right about then you know Hey, it's a different. If we take advantage of the concentrated time we've got, it'll make a difference. If you come into God's house, let me meddle for just a minute at the risk of you never coming back. If you come in and you're not so much worried about what's going on around you and you don't really care about what time it is or the climate or where you parked or what you got to do later on. But in that short window of time that I've got your attention, God is speaking to you and you focus on him Church will be a revolutionary experience for you. The fire on the altar being there all the time, Clarinda, was their, was their reminder that they need to worship God continually, not just on Sunday. And God forbid some of you even sneak one in on a Wednesday. No, it's all the time. Thursday afternoon. We worship God on Thursday afternoon. Why? Nobody told me that's not in the bulletin. <laughs> yeah. Remember that. The fire. Prove God's presence. It proved that we worship God all the time. And lastly, perpetual fire symbolized the continual need for atonement and reconciliation with God. Boy, I need that. Every day of my life, I need to be reminded that the price has already been paid. That Jesus has already made the ultimate sacrifice. Nothing I do will equal that. But they had to have that reminder Krista, that fire there in the middle of where they lived, in the middle of their community all the time to remind them that we need to be closer to God. Reconcile. How many of you still reconcile your bank book to the bank? Does anybody do that? Your checkbook? Do you still? Now, the reason I say still, I used to think I have checks, so I have money, right? That's pretty good. That doesn't work, right, Ray? (laughs) Ray always says, no, the bank needs to reconcile with me. That's why Ray goes at it with the church. And I agree with that. Praise God. But, you know, my mom and dad would sit down and you look and you get the bank book, you get your checkbook. Bank book is old as well, isn't it? You get your checkbook out. The statement used to come, hang on, kids, it used to come in the mail. Yeah, it would come in the mail. And we would trudge out on the horse to the mailbox. (laughs) And we would get it out. And we would take that long eight-mile journey back home in the cold and snow, take it out. And we would sit down with a feather pencil and start reconciling. Yeah, 
way back in the day. And then mom would make oatmeal over an open fire and we all sang Kumbaya. Long time ago. Long time ago, right? No, but now, you know why I say that? Now it's online. You can sit and watch with an app on a smartphone or on your laptop and you can look every time anything is done. Yep, there it is. You know why I know this? Because over here, I just went out. I don't know what happened there. You know why I know this? My wife sits there and she's got the budget on the laptop and the bank app on the phone. And if I spend a dollar over something I'm supposed to, you know what it really, really brings? The, I'm going to get in trouble. You know what brings the fear of God into me and makes me want to turn around and go to Ray's house? When I walk in, when I walk in the garage door, Chris, when I come in the house through that little hallway into the kitchen and she's at the dining room table with her glasses on the end of her nose and I see she's got the phone here looking at the app and she's at the computer and I turn around and I go, oh, no. I told her the other day, I said, I could be gone on an eight-year African journey, lead 1.5 million people to Jesus, come walking in, haven't showered in six weeks, tired from 8,000 miles and 90 hours of flying, and to come in and see her in that position. Guess what? What's this $8 Burger King thing here on the thing, brother? <laughs> it's not going to matter. There's the reconcile. You know why? She says, we have a plan. Here's what we've got. There's only so many beans in the pot. And these beans need to go where they're going. And if they go somewhere they're not supposed to, there's less beans for something else. Can anybody say amen to that? (laughs) Well, I took a few beans and stuck them here. That's just what I'm saying. (laughs) We have to reconcile with the plan. Reconcile. You with me? I went all the way around the block to get to that point. (laughs) Reconcile. You know why? God has a plan. God says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you what? A hard time? No, rest. You know what the rest is? To know that I'm in tune with him and I don't have to walk around in fear that I'm going to walk in on him with the glasses down, look at me going, hey, pal, we need to talk. If I stay in line at home, then, Jim, I don't have to worry about walking in the house. It's like, oh, she's doing the budget. God is good. And I can trip right on down the hall and do my thing. There's peace in that. Are you with me? There's peace in knowing as a kid. Let me, let me really hit home. When you came home on time, not past your curfew, you walk in, slam the door, clap your hands and yell, I'm home. Try coming in after curfew. It's a little different entrance. And our worship to God's the same way. We can have a firm, straight backbone, still not perfect, but knowing we're forgiven, trying our best to live within the framework of his plan gives you a lot of confidence, gives you a lot of guilt-free nights. And helps you realize it's good to be a child of God. And so he says this continual fire has to remind us we are constantly reconciling. We're constantly looking at the plan. Where am I at today? How am I doing today? Here's where he wants me. Here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm doing. What can I do today to be better? That constant worship. The last thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Here's a little paragraph of some verses that I use as a checklist sometimes. He says, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. In other words, that means be thankful to the people around you that are working to give you what you have, right? And are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. I just admonished you a little bit about some stuff this morning, but you know where it's coming from, a heart of love. Amen? Because God's plan is the best plan. And this altar is real. So he says, Uh, that are over you and esteem them highly in love. Love everybody. Hold everybody in high regard. Be at peace amongst yourselves. Isn't it good to get along? I would much rather get along than not, Lucy. Amen? Now we exhort you, brethren, and warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. And then he says, here's the quickies. Rejoice always. Can you always be happy? Are you kidding? Yeah, give it a shot. Then what's 17 say? What? I can't hear you. And what does that mean? Never stop praying. Don't let the fire go out. Let it continually be burning. Always have your mind on godly things. Always have a prayer in your heart coming out of your lips on your mind. Pray without ceasing. Amen? And everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then if we get that, the reason these are later is because you got to get rid of some stuff to get to this point. Do not quench the spirit. 
Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Oh, here's my favorite. Abstain from every form of evil. That's a wide-ranging verse with not very many words. <laughs> but, Ted, it's doable. Abstain from every form of evil. You know what? None of that is even remotely possible if we let the fire go down. If we don't stay in communication right here with God. Amen? A lot of guys that I grew up with that started out in the ministry together, Dan would say, they'd say, well, how'd your church go? I said, oh, it was great. Great spirit. Sermon went really good. How many came to the altar? And if I said none, they go, well, you didn't have a very good service, did you? And then when I first started preaching, Gary, I had one old guy always ask me every week, son, they always call you son for some reason. I have no idea why. How many came to the altar when you preached today? I said, none. Like, well, it'll happen for you. And I thought, why are they acting like I'm, you know, falling down out here? I feel God's presence. And I began to, to look at that as a kid when I started out pastoring even. I thought, if nobody comes, Jim, to the altar, that's kind of like, you know, they eat your buffet and go out the side door and don't pay. You know what I mean? But that's not it. Because raise your hand if you pray at home. I mean, hello, right? That's not, raise your hand if you eat and breathe at home, right? Of course you pray at home. I will say, there is something great about that immediate response when God really pricks your heart and you really feel like it's him leading you here. Again, Tom, this represents God saying, I'm ready. Come and speak to me. Very, very holy and, and special place in the church. And we're welcome to come to it whenever you want. While we're singing, you can come. It doesn't have to be at the end anyway. Amen? I want you to understand that. But I also understand that if I'm going to tell you that God hears you wherever you are, then it doesn't always have to be immediately at the end of the service. You know why? I have seen people come and pray just because the pastor said that. Don't do that. You're not trying to impress me. I'm not going to be standing in front of you at Judgment Day. I'm going to be standing in front of the same one you will. But you know, it's those times when you really feel like if your heart's skipping a beat, that's not always because the sermon's almost over. Okay, that's probably God getting a hold of you saying, hey, let's talk about this. Many, many times, this is why you don't go with the numbers at the end of the message. People come in with a problem, and nothing I said has got anything to do with what they're dealing with. But they knew coming in, I've really got to go talk to God about something. That's why it's not about me. But I, I just, I've never really blurted this out like I have today. And the reason I want you to understand, because the altar is very important because of what it represents and what happens at that altar. People get married in this area. People come and give communion. They join the church. They get saved. It is. It's a, it's a very sacred place. But it's also a place that God has to draw you down to come talk to him at. Amen. And the one thing that's the same throughout all these sacrifices was the place for it to happen. So I just want to tell you, this is a place where it can happen. It's up to you to let it happen. God's waiting right here if you come and give it to him. But you also know what else? And Brittany, I gave you a hard time. And her birthday was yesterday. I'm very sorry. But you know what? It can happen at work. You're surrounded by, what do you teach, fifth grade? How many fifth graders all day? How many? I thought you said 50. Did you say 50? 15 or 50? Two years away from how I'm going to be old, 50. <laughs> Did you hear that? 50 fifth graders all day. From what to what? Like 8 to 3? Something like 7 to 3. It gets worse every time I ask her a question. <laughs> God love her heart. I mean, I'm not saying I got anything wrong with fifth graders. I got one, okay? If you ever can't think of anything to pray about, Brittany and the 50 fifth graders right there would do it. Amen. Don't tell me Brittany doesn't pray during the week. <laughs> Absolutely. Joe, you guys got a tough job. You guys got a lot that you deal with, right? There's a lot of times when the, when the sound goes off. Any of you guys in here that deal with being called out on a call and EMT, fire, and all that kind of stuff, police, you know? You know what that's like. You wonder, what's going to happen? Am I going to come home? A lot of prayer. Amen? Prayer's not just something you wiggle your lips and say a few little words that were drilled into you to be memorized. It comes from here. The altar is our reminder that God says, I'm ready to listen 24 hours a day. As we stand and the, they come with a closing song with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. <clears throat> Jesus, we love you today. Thankful for your blessing. Thankful for your presence, for your word, for the reminder, any place we've ever read throughout your word that tells us you stand ready to listen. 
You stand ready to help carry the load. You stand ready to, to continue to shape us into who you want us to be. And I pray today, God, that we would just remember every time we walk in this church and see the altar. It's not a barrier. It's not a, a fence that keeps us away. They're just arms that reach out to us that tell us you're ready. You're available. You're, you're listening. You're near. But that can also be wherever we go. But no matter what we do when we come in here and we see the front and we see the altar, as beautiful as it blends in, we also want it to be that reminder. Lots of things happen right here. And so I pray today, God, this may be the day something needs to happen for someone. Maybe they need to finally give their heart to you. Maybe there's a need. Maybe there's a problem. It, It only will be worth it. It will only have staying power if you're drawing them to here. I just pray that you would have your way. I really feel your presence in this place today. Thank you for the word that we've heard. And now just help us apply it. And by apply it means make it part of us when we go from here today. In Jesus' name, and amen.